Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast is sponsored by Compassion International. $38 a month. That's all it takes to make a difference in a child's life. And so many of us are wondering, how can we make a difference? Where can we help? Where can we truly make a difference in someone's life? And how about if that someone was a child in need, a child in poverty, a child lacking food, education, medical care, and vocational training? Well, that's where Compassion International comes in. For $38 a month, you go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. That's the website, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Find a child, sponsor a child, pray about sponsoring a child, and then that's it. You release them from poverty and you make a connection and make a difference releasing a child from poverty that will last for eternity. The most trusted child development ministry in the world is Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Today on the podcast, it is really awesome to be joined by former NFL kicker Rolf Bernerschka. And it's a great name, first of all. I remember having his football card as a kid. And Rolf was selected in the 12th round. There isn't even a 12th round in the NFL anymore. The 12th round of the 1977 NFL draft by the Oakland Raiders, the 334th overall selection that year. And then he was traded to the Chargers, and that's where he really made a name for himself. Played with San Diego back then in 1977 to 1986. He was the 1983 Walter Payton Man of the Year Award winner. He was an All-Pro selection in 1980 and a Pro Bowl selection in 1982. Those early 80s, late 70s Chargers teams changed the way football is played today. They were run by a quarterback named Dan Fouts, who many of you know as a broadcaster, and their offense was high-powered and ahead of its time. And when you look at Dan Fouts' numbers now, it's pretty common in the NFL for a quarterback to throw for over 4,000 yards. Well, back then, he was the only guy doing it, and it was a really amazing time to watch football sort of be transformed in the way that the Chargers were doing it. And they might have been, and I say might have been, the best team to never win a Super Bowl. Those late 70s, early 80s Chargers teams made three straight AFC Championship game appearances and fell short in all three of them. And Rolf Benershka, our guest today on the program, was a part of those teams. Uh, But Rolf's story goes even further than just being a kicker in the NFL. This guy I mean, it's just an incredibly powerful story of what he was able to overcome with Crohn's disease and colitis and really suffering uh, life-threatening illnesses that almost killed him and yet able to come back, able to return and able to kick successfully in the NFL. So this podcast is about Roth's story, about overcoming adversity, overcoming health challenges, trusting in the Lord. He shares a great story about coming to faith during his time with the Chargers And then we talk a little football. He played in two of the most famous NFL postseason playoff games you will ever see. And they happened in back-to-back weeks back in January of 1982, the 1981 season. But in January of 1982, in the famous epic in Miami when the Chargers beat the Dolphins in overtime, 41-38. to And then a week later, playing in 59 degrees below zero wind chill. Maybe the coldest game ever to be played in the NFL as far as windshield goes in Cincinnati, Ohio, when the Bengals beat his Chargers 27-7 to go on to the Super Bowl in Super Bowl 16 that year. So I like talking football history. That's just the junkie in me, the football junkie in me that loves talking about that. And I also like hearing, obviously, faith stories, and Roth's one is a powerful one. So let's get to it. Roth Benershka, former NFL kicker, joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. Roth, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. Good to be on. It's great to have you on the podcast today. And let's start with the playoffs. We're taping this January 15th, and we're in the midst of the NFL playoffs right now. You played in some big games, certainly kicked in some big games that I want to talk about in a minute. But a few weeks ago, we saw a a situation happen with the Bears kicker, Cody Parkey, and he went through the lows of being a kicker and missing the kick that was 
of course, tipped. Um, but seeing his team lose and he took the brunt of that, getting booed and all that good stuff or bad stuff, I guess, off the field, away from the field after the game. I'm sure in your 10-year career you've experienced that kind of a feeling. Can you share what that's like to have a game riding on whether you make a kick or not and what that's like? Yeah, it's first of all, it's thrilling to have the chance to do it. And it's just absolutely devastating when you feel like you let your team down, when the crescendo builds and you get a chance to walk out there and do it. And then it doesn't happen. It's, it's just heartbreaking. It's, it's, it's so incredibly discouraging to, to know that um, your teammates who worked so hard to get you there, both that game and, and during the season, it's just, it's just one of those devastating things that unfortunately is the risk we take as kickers. And, you know, we, we, it's, it's often said, you know, we, we, we forget the ones we make uh, much quicker than we ever forget the ones that we miss. And you just hope that you don't have a career defined by a miss because it's not fair, but life's not fair. And we're all forced to deal with it. Now, the, 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 the amazing good things that come out of it are the way people rally around you. I mean, you discover you have friends on the team, uh, friends in the community, your, your, your buddies that come around you. You know, that said, you have to deal with it yourself ultimately and, and, and recognize where it falls in the spectrum of things. It's really important for sure. Um, but you will learn to put it in perspective, a proper perspective. And frankly, I don't know how you deal with something like that without faith. And yeah. I, know, I know Cody's got some faith there, but I, that's, it's a devastating thing. Yeah, and I I think even in the modern day of social media and everybody having access to everybody's life, that's got to make it even harder. I mean, in the 80s, it was much different. You could, you know, you're in the newspaper maybe, but you could kind of probably just go about your life in a different way if you miss a big kick. Um, Sands maybe Scott Norwood, who missed the field goal kick, obviously, and that was difficult for him to overcome. But it's a different age now with this social media world where everybody's connected, right? No doubt. I mean, it's 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 multiplied by thousands when everywhere you look, somebody's got an opinion. And I remember um, <laughs> I missed a, a critical kick in my my uh, second season. I had just gotten ill. We'll talk later about my illness. And yeah. it was a devastating uh, uh, kick. We were playing the Raiders. We were. I missed uh, two field goals and an extra point. I slipped on the dirt infield, and it was the first week of my illness. I had a high fever. I was really struggling. And, it became known as the Holy Roller game. Kenny Stabler with, you know, two and a half minutes to go, marched, you know, 70 yards, and they scored a touchdown and kicked the extra point to win by a point. And there should have been, you know, a penalty called on that last play. It was an intentional forward pass. It was a fumble intentional kick in the end zone. I mean, there were three fouls that could have been called. The rest didn't call any, and they kicked the extra point, run off the field. And I remember, you know, everybody's just devastating, mad at the referee for that. Well, the next day there were – you know, six letters to the editor and five of them chastised the referee. And the, and the last one said, we didn't lose a game because of the referee. We lost because our kicker can't kick short field goals and extra points. Mm. And he was right. And it just, it just killed me. And I remember the next week I got a letter from my college roommate that included the, the quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the critical counts. It's not the man who points out where the grown man stumbled or the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who, if he wins, knows the triumph of high achievement. But if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Now, I memorized that quote. I put it on, my, on the wall of my locker. And, and, uh, and it's true. It's so easy to sit in the tenth row and criticize, and it's so difficult to be out there and not just kicking, but in life in general, we, we sometimes don't take risks for the fear of failure. And, and, uh, you know, for every kicker that's gone out there to, to miss, he's made a ton and, and we have to deal with it, but it's, you're in the fight and, and, uh, there's something to be said for that. Absolutely. Now I want to talk a little playoff football. I want to hear your, your, your faith journey as well. And maybe they intersect somewhere and I'll hear that in a second, but You've been out of the game for a while, and I, I know as a kid, I was telling you before 
our taping started that I grew up in the 80s, and that was the he- the heyday, the late 70s and early 80s of football, and those Chargers teams were really, really good. And the playoffs are a different type of atmosphere for sure. And you kicked in many playoff games. Two of the most memorable happened in back-to-back weeks in 1981 uh, and the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So I'd love for you to kind of just share some memories of each game. The first one being the Miami Dolphins, I guess I would call that the overtime game that was in this incredible heat and humidity that was taking place in Miami, sudden death. And the Chargers went 41-38. to 38. You hit the game-winning field goal. But, the, again, you want to talk about ups and downs within a football game. Many call it maybe the greatest playoff game of all time, if not one of the greatest. I remember watching that as a kid and just being you know, engulfed in what was happening in this game. Can you share some memories from that specific playoff game? Yeah, that, that game was a, a game that defined our team, the Chargers back then, which – was really the most prolific uh, offensive, you know, team to that point. We really, I would say, with Coach Coriel and Dan Fouts at the helm, redefined offensive football. The whole West Coast passing attack was really created by by Don Coriel and his staff. But yeah. that game is 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 now known as the Epic in Miami. It's kind of replayed every year, which is amazing to me because it was January 1982 when it happened. But for me, it's an important game because it was a, it was almost a metaphor for my life, uh, an analogy to my life. Um, it was a game where we came in. We were we were the high powered offense. Dan Fouts, the quarterback, Charlie Joyner, and Wes Chandler, and Kellen Winslow were our receivers and tight ends, and Chuck Munchie was a running back who just was a stud. And we had a gra- really creative offense. Well, we jump into a twenty four nothing lead at the end of the first quarter. We're we're golden. We're you know, back then we didn't make much money, so we were all thinking, you know, a playoff check's coming. This is awesome. <laughs> well, then, you know, Don Shula changes quarterbacks and puts in a veteran backup named Don Strock, and they start engineering this comeback. And there's a very famous play just before halftime. They throw a hook and ladder play. They throw it to wide receiver, catches it, pitches to the running back going by, and they score. And yeah. It's suddenly 24-17, and... If you're standing next to me and yelling at me, I couldn't hear you. The, the fans in Miami were just going crazy. So we go into halftime, and and nobody knows what to do. Everybody's got their head down. Coaches are in the corner. They don't know what to do. We totally lost momentum. We're, we're getting, we're just getting blown away everywhere. And the last guy in the in in, in the locker room is Dan Fouts. He comes in and he'd been complaining to the refs or something. He was this fiery, intensely competitive guy, yeah. most competitive guy I've ever known. He sees everybody with the head down. He just takes his helmet. He throws it the length of the locker room. Get your heads out of your butts. They haven't stopped us yet. And he just kind of yanks everybody back out of there. They're, they're, they're feeling badly about themselves. And, and it starts in the second half, and we go back and forth, and we tie it, and they go ahead, and we tie it, and they go ahead. And we have to tie it with 30 seconds to go. And we do. One of the toughest kicks for me was that extra point. It was – muddy and crazy down there in the field and yeah. so now with 30 seconds to go we kind of squib kick it they get the ball and and uh a couple of plays later they set up for a field goal to win the game and our special teams coach inserts kellen winslow six foot six tight end who blocks the kick <laughs> so now it goes to overtime we go to overtime we get the ball quickly we have a long pass play and we're down in field goal range close field goal range and they call for field goal unit on on third down and our team's not quite ready it's deep into overtime as you mentioned it's hot and humid our guys are worn out and we have three guys on the field goal protection team who are defensive players they don't hear the call so we're out there lining up for the field goal we're missing the three guys and so they're trying to run them in and run them in and and i i remember thinking i and, and actually telling the whole uh, you know ed luther hey do we got to call timeout it's, it's a rain no, no no it's short we'll just kick we'll just... so we rush. I don't take control of the situation, and I miss the kick. Hmm. And I remember walking to the sideline going, oh, my gosh, I've let this team down. Um, they're going to make me walk back to San Diego from Miami. I, this is awful. And for the next six minutes, I had to watch Miami march down the field and line their kicker up for a second chance. And I just remember like the, the, the minutes were like hours and I just, it's like a guy going to a slow death. And, and unfortunately their kicker kicks it heavy and 
to, you know, hits the ground first and kicks it into our line. Hmm. So it's no good. And suddenly we get the ball and march down, and I have a second chance to kick the game winner. And and we make it, and we end. And, and uh, I remember flying home, um, Jason, and, and remembering what I'd gone through prior to that. Um, I mentioned earlier I went through this bad illness in my, my second season. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Yeah. And, and played sick that season, um, lost 25 pounds during the, the year in and out of the hospital, but kept playing, tried to play my third season, um, collapsed on the team plane, flying home and landed the plane. I needed surgery. Um, there were complications in the surgery. I had a second, uh, abdominal surgery six days later. I woke up from that surgery in the same hospital where my dad was a practicing physician, 65 pounds below my playing weight hmm. with two off bags on my side and, and septic. And, um, I have a, a near death experience that night. The Lord, the Lord jumps in and saves me when there's no reason I should be alive. I, my organs are shutting down. I'm, I'm completely massively infected and I've been on immunosuppressants and, and, and I live the night and I survive the next night and the next night. And I, Spend five and a half weeks in the ICU, two more weeks in the hospital, and then I'm released to the care of my parents. And I'm 24 years old, and I'm looking around. I go, "What just happened? And why did I live? Why, why didn't I die?" From my perspective, with two ostomy bags on my side, there was nothing in my life I thought that was worth living for. I love sports of all kind. I was a ski racer, hockey player, tennis player. Lived on the beach here in San Diego. Love the love the ocean. I think I'll never do that again with ostomy bags. I'm making my living as a professional athlete. Certainly, nobody's ever played with an ostomy bag. That's out. Um, and I was single and like girls. And I'm going, who's ever going to marry me? Lord, why didn't why didn't you just let me die? And and I guess it, you know, thank goodness for unanswered prayers. I didn't. And then I was forced to deal with it. And the short story is through just God's grace and unbelievable support from everybody from our strength coach to the ownership. I was able to return to play and compete for my job and earn my, my position back and play seven more years. Mm -hmm. Um, first player to ever play with an ostomy bag. Um, and it fundamentally changed my life, gave me a different perspective on life. But that second chance was like that kick. And nobody gets a second chance to kick in overtime if you miss it. Think about it. Yeah. How many times does that happen? Never. And it did for me, and it, and it, and it changed uh, everything. It, it, in returning to play, um, a lot was written about my illness. This would have been the 1980 uh, return season for me, wherever we would play in Denver, Dallas, Seattle, Kansas City. The local sports writer would write about what I went through, or there'd be a TV interview, and and wherever those articles or or, or stories were were shown or, or or written, patients or family members of patients would read them, and I'd come back the next week, and there'd be fifty letters in my locker, all the same. You know, Rolf Benersch always misspelled yeah. simply San Diego Chargers, San Diego, and they didn't up in my locker, and the letters were all the same. How can you play football with an ostomy? I'm trying to. And it was like fill in the blank, go to school, be a dad, go to work. And I realized nobody was talking about this. It's a difficult illness, difficult surgery. We don't talk about those kinds of issues. And suddenly I, I realized, you know, I was given this opportunity to deflect attention on me to the plight of these patients. There are 3 million people with inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, or ulcerative colitis. There are over 100,000 ostomy surgeries a year. Every one of those fundamentally life-changing and here I had an opportunity to sort of shed light on this condition and and provide hope to patients who think like me I'd rather die than wear a bag well for every patient I've spoken to since then and there have been thousands I've heard equally often if only I had known life was this good after an ostomy surgery I would have had it years before so hmm. you know I have the perspective now Jason at 63 looking back at my life and realizing how God put things together 
that didn't make sense when you're going through it. Absolutely. I was devastated at 23 to be diagnosed. My career was just ahead of me. I was playing in my hometown. Everything was sort of opening up for me. And all of a sudden this happened and you sit there and you go, why, why, why? It's not fair. It's not fair. And like anybody that's had to deal with anything, why you learn after a while is the wrong question. It's, it's what now? Where do I go from here? And in the process of that, you get to discover so many things, God's grace, the importance of friends and family, a, a different way of looking at life, and even a different way of looking at missed kicks. You are able to put it in a different perspective. Not that it isn't painful, not that it is important, but in the scheme of things, you look, you, you get to say, you know what, I tried, I did the best I could, Cody, did the best you could, circumstances didn't work out, and in the process of that, you discover this indomitable spirit that I believe God's gifted every one of us with. I've seen it thousands of times in patients. When we choose bitter or better, we come to that fork in the road every every patient does and ultimately every kick or will when you miss something. When you choose better and you start down the road, you start to uncover these gifts. And one is this spirit that 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 teaches us that we have greater courage a greater ability to cope, greater perseverance than we ever thought we had. But for most of us, it, it sort of lies dormant in us until we're really tested, and that's when we get to become changed. Ralph Benershka is our guest here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. So I can pivot and go to your health, or I can stay in the football world for a minute, and I'm going to stay because I don't think people realize that in that game, the Epic in Miami, I want to – recommend everybody go to youtube and just watch that they actually have the full broadcast the nfl on the youtube channel and it's fascinating to watch football in the way it was broadcasted in 1982 and just that game was incredible but a week later is an even in my opinion an even crazier game because you go from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows but it's not just about losing the game in the afc championship against cincinnati but it's I mean, it's not technically the coldest game ever, I think, but with a wind chill factor, it probably is 59 below. That's Let me repeat that, 59 below for those that are listening in Cincinnati. And you're a kicker, so you're not running around the whole game, and you're not you know, hitting people the whole game. And plus, you mentioned the ostomy bag. I'm sure you had that too. Tell me what comes to mind when I mention that game. I think it's called the Freezer Bowl, right? It, it is. It, it, you know, we had gone from like, it was like low 90s or mid 90s in Miami, you know, six days earlier to minus 59 oh. in Cincinnati. We were the best team in football that year. Nice. I'm convinced, we're all convinced if we had won that game, we'd have won two or three Super Bowls. So we go into that game and it's so cold. Um, I remember waking up in the in the hotel and, and looking outside, and you could see the river by the stadium, and it looks like a hot tub. You know, the steam's coming off, but it's a bright, sunny day, and you think, oh, it's, it's fine. When, when you open the door and, and, and get out and walk to the to the bus, you go, oh, my gosh, it's like you get hit with this. So guys are sprinting to the bus, looking around, going, oh, my goodness. We get to the stadium, and it's, it's not just cold, it's windy. Mm. which made it worse for us, particularly Dan Fouch was a, a passer where our, our game was, was passing. And I remember going out for pregame warmups and we kick one kick and, and, and my holder goes, do you want me now or do you want me during the game? I go, well, I need you during the game. He goes, well, I'm going in. So <laughs> I didn't get to warm up. I had a ball play. I have to hold the ball for me trying to kick uh, pregame warmups. But, you know, the, 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 looking back, you know, they won the coin toss. Mm. And they took the wind. And we couldn't throw it. We couldn't punt it against the wind. We were down 17 nothing at the end of the first quarter, and, and that was the game. We, we just couldn't come back. And it was devastating because we, we really felt we were, we were the best team and could have won in any other circumstance. But um, that was life. We, we, we couldn't overcome the wind, and they won. And, and then they lose in the Super Bowl to, to San Francisco, a team that we'd also beaten. So... It was frustrating. It's one of those things you would look back on our careers, and we can't change it now, but we all knew it was our chance, and we didn't get it done. 
59 below though as a kicker how are you staying warm how are, how is your feet i mean i'm just i go outside to go get the paper and my feet start getting cold and i run inside and you have to be outside for three hours in 59 below as a kicker what are you doing to stay warm if anything <laughs> i don't even know if yeah, anything's well, working right the good news is we had heated benches where they blow heat under and you just kind of sit on it almost like a potty and and your feet are in it and your your butt's in it so that kept us relatively warm but I had one very embarrassing uh, situation that game. We they called for field goal, uh, and it was a short field goal, it was like thirty four or thirty seven yards, I think. And but it was into the wind, and it was into the end of the tunnel where they actually had a uh, a tunnel that had a uh, like a door. And, and when we were going into the wind, they would open the door, so the Jeez. tunnel would like be like a wind tunnel blowing at us, and we couldn't throw it or anything. But anyway, I, had, I think it was a thirty four yard field goal, and I mean, I nailed it. Yeah. And it was short. I mean, it went up just like hit a ball and it was short. And I'm like, going, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. But oh. they, it, it was uh, it was definitely cold. Um, Dan Fout still has frostbite from it. And um, when you look at the video of it, it's just, uh, it was just amazing. It really is. Yeah. NFL films, because everything is in slow motion in NFL films and the way that they shoot it, it's really incredible to watch. And the, the resources that athletes i think have today in cold weather weren't those same resources back in 1982 or 81 and i remember i think dan and uh, ken anderson the two quarterbacks in that game were the only two that had their hands exposed the whole game but other people were wearing almost like regular gloves they didn't have the gloves that they have today right no we didn't you know and then, and then the cincinnati actually came out their offensive lineman came out without any sleeves so bare arms just so that, <laughs> you know they're ready and of course we were wins from southern california which right. I, yeah it clearly wasn't true but um yeah the wind the wind was awful that day oh just terrible it sounds like you don't want to talk about it much more which i completely <laughs> understand even 37 years later it's crazy yeah, it's like we it was like yesterday honestly we all remember it flying yeah. home from that and uh you know the cool thing we landed in, in san diego and there were like 25 30 thousand people in the parking lot waiting for us wow to encourage us and cheer us and those are the memories that you know aren't talked about as much um, no social media back then but it made a huge impact on us as as players that we'd given it everything we had and there was this love affair with our city back then and which makes it that much heart more heartbreaking to have lost the team and there was such a cool relationship with with the community that's missed now Roth Bernerska is our guest here on Sports Spectrum this is a faith in sports podcast and you've mentioned the Lord a couple times in your answers here so let's hear your testimony about how you came to faith in jesus and maybe where that faith came into play with that illness you can take us there too if you want you mentioned the illness in 1978 and certainly the crohn's disease take us through your your testimony and how you came to know uh who christ is yeah jason it's interesting how the lord works um you know again looking back at life it's easier to see but when you're going through it, it's, it's sort of harder to understand where the really seminal moments were. And for me um, and my brother and sister, my mom was raised Catholic, and we went to uh, to Mass on Sundays. We got confirmed, did catechism. Back in New Hampshire, my dad was a medical school professor at Dartmouth, but he was a German immigrant that survived the war, came over shortly afterwards, had to learn the language, sort of the classic American story of work hard, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, very self-reliant, very bright guy, scientific mind. And so we would literally be in church uh, and he would be outside waiting uh, with skis on the car. And as soon as mass was over, we'd go ski. And hmm. he, he sort of, um, you know, that was mom's deal with us and not, not his at all. So we grew up sort of watching that. That was our role model. Um, brilliant guy, you know, extraordinary father and scientist. Um, you know, he's written 500 journals, uh, over 30 books. He just passed away a couple of months ago at 94. Uh, just an icon of a guy, left legacies all over the place. But that was our role model. We moved to, uh, he moved us to San Diego uh, when I was going into my my sophomore year in, in high school, which was difficult. We were deep into sports back in New Hampshire. Then I ended up getting drafted into the NFL, which was really um, difficult for him. It was, you know, 
really, when are you going to get a real job and make a difference in your life? You know, that's just, that's silly. And mm. there's more parts of the story about that. Cause I actually didn't kick until I was a senior in high school and got talked into that. And, you know, kicking footballs, if you're a soccer player, isn't that difficult. And I had scholarship chances to go to big schools and dad said, why would you do that? You know, that's not how I go to college. And my answer is right. You're right. And so I went to UC Davis. I studied zoology. I had a passion for wildlife. Thought that's what I ended up doing. And um, was you know didn't go there to play and got discovered really by my head coach who had been called by several of the teams that were recruiting me. That said, what you know what are you what are you doing? You must be doing something illegal. That you know this kicker would choose Davis over Southern Cal or Stanford. And <laughs> my Davis coach, well, I don't know what you're talking about. We didn't sign a kicker. And, what's his name? And he tracks me down and calls me in my dorm room. He says, you know, why aren't you coming out for the team? I go, well, I didn't come here to go to football, play football. And he talks me into, anyway, short story is I end up getting drafted by the Raiders right after they won the Super Bowl, 1977. It was John Madden, Kenny Stabler, Fred Boletnikoff, Cliff Blance, all those. That was a wild team back then. Oh yeah. Um, and then I was released. It's sort of a crazy deal and, and uh, picked up by San Diego four days before the season and I didn't know anybody had to earn my way. They released a kicker that everybody liked. And so I'm trying to make my way. And there were a couple of guys on the team that were extraordinary to me. And one was my holder, a guy named Mike Fuller, who had a strong faith in the Lord. Uh, I, I sort of joke later in life, you know, he, he held my football feature in his hand. Every time we went to kick, it doesn't matter how good a kicker you are. If you got a bad holder, you can't kick it. Yeah. He was an extraordinary holder, but he also held my future, my eternal future in his hand. Cause he was the guy that invited me to, to chapels and then to Bible studies. And there was something about five or six guys in our team that was different than, than the rest of us. Most of us were on this roller coaster highs. If you felt great, if you did well, lows, if you did poorly and felt terrible, but there, these other guys live life differently. There was a more even keel, um, my locker was next to Charlie Joyner, just an extraordinary guy. You didn't know if he'd caught three touchdown passes or dropped three after the game. He was the same. And Mike and those guys kind of breathed into me, and and there was something about that that I'd never had experienced. And started reading the Bible, started um, resonating with the, the, the promises that Christ made, and and made a decision to accept Christ and. And I'm so thankful that I did because it was then that I started to go through my own struggles and and people were praying for me and the, the team was and and it was a horrific time. I, I can't even uh, explain. But what got me through was this belief that somehow it was going to work out. And even if it didn't, I had an eternal home in heaven. And And then I look back now and see how it all worked out. It actually brings me to my knees, Jason. I, I am the most grateful, patient, most grateful player um, to have done what I was able to do to deflect the attention to the point of patience. I'm still doing that, you know, 40 years later. Mm. And my life was really redirected by that and, and by my faith. And, um, I wrote a book, my autobiography, called Alive and Kicking, where I wanted to write it earlier, right after my illness, but my faith hadn't matured enough, and God kind of didn't allow that to happen. And then a great friend of mine from high school who worked for Focus on a Family at the time, Mike Yorkey, called me up one day, and, and we wrote the book together, and, and um, it, it would have been a different book had I written right after my illness, because like a lot of people, when I got better, I sort of stiff armed the Lord and said, I got this from here and continued my career. And then, um, when I left football, I, I really recommitted my faith and, uh, met my wife and we built our life on that. We have had our own ch challenges. We have four kids. We have three with special needs Two We adopted from Russia that have been extraordinarily challenging, but, hmm. but our faith you know, gotten us through this in ways that have made it an extraordinary journey. And I feel so lucky to have met her. Um, she challenges me every day. She's an incredibly strong person. And we've, we've just had this amazing life together that was never easy. 
but was extraordinarily fulfilling in so many ways. Tell me about because adversity is something we all deal with. You've described your your adversity and the and the you know the very difficult time that you walk through. Um, tell me about the role faith played in helping you through that, and and I maybe even take it to now. And how is your health today? I don't. I mean, I'm sure you talk about that. You're obviously being able to do a podcast, and and you're working, and, and you're doing great advocate work. But tell me how your health is now, and maybe through that all that over the last thirty years, how your walk with the Lord has has kind of helped you and encouraged you through that. Yeah. So I I, I look back. So I I, I had uh, Crohn's disease. I was sick for a year and a half. There weren't very good treatments back then. I had an emergency surgery. There was a they did a resection, took out part of my colon, hmm. and then six days later, uh, the anastomosis line broke down internally. I started to leak sort of bacteria all over my in, in, uh, inside, which gets into your bloodstream, and I became septic, very infected, and they had to do a second surgery that left me with two ostomy bags, and uh, I would play with that for four years. Um, made it to the pro bowl with that, which was interesting because when you play on your team, um, people know what you've gone through, but when you play with strangers who don't, they don't quite understand until you're in the shower and you're, you're wearing an ostomy bag. Yeah. It was hard to, had to explain that one to Jack Lambert, but, um, um, right after, in fact, right after the pro bowl went back to New York, had a, a third surgery that got rid of the rest of my colon, moved my ostomy to the other side so I could kick better. And then, a year later, actually had a fourth surgery that internalized my pouch. This is more than you can understand, perhaps, but it got rid of the need for me to wear an external appliance, but I use a tube to intubate myself, and hmm. I've been that way since 1983, and um, my health is extraordinary, although I, I, I did need 80 units of blood from uh, during my two surgeries and ended up getting hepatitis C. Uh, this was 1979. I didn't know that uh, until our last son was born, and I needed more insurance. And went in for a routine exam and found out I had hepatitis C. And I go, "Oh my gosh, am I going to die?" I mean, now it's not my silly football career. I've got four kids and a wife, yeah. and we didn't have good treatments back then. And and I ended up going through three year long daily injections of interferon, really difficult side effects. And the last one worked, and I'm cured of my hep C. And I think back, Jason, 1979 was when I had my surgery. Same year, Arthur Ashe had surgery for a heart valve. He was a hero of mine. I was a big tennis player growing up. Yeah. And he gets bad blood and dies of, AIDS, dies of AIDS. And it could have been me. I, I could have easily gotten AIDS. Instead, I got hep C, and uh, science had moved along quickly enough to where we managed it, and now it's completely curable and... and uh, so my health is really good. Um, I look back and, you know, I, I, I wish I could say I was a, a better believer, a better Christian. There was this always this tug between trying to figure it out on my own and leaning on the Lord. And um, the, 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 the best thing that happened to me is, is after leaving football, um, I was asked to join a fellowship group. And when I got married, we, we've been in a fellowship group ever since and have basically done life with about six or seven couples and it's amazing how every one of us at some point during our journey together has sort of been in the box if you will you know one we've, we've got challenging kids um one family lost a child to suicide we've had you know um, challenges with marriages and business and all that and yet because we've sort of shared this intimate relationship with these other couples we've we've managed to get through it and I'm not sure how that would have been possible had we not been together and, and really give the Lord the credit because at the end of the day, that was our cornerstone through all of that. Rolf, just as I'm listening and it kept, it keeps coming back three or four times because I don't know what it is. Can you explain what an ostomy bag is and how crazy it is that you could actually be kicking a football in the NFL with an ostomy bag. You mentioned the Jack Lambert kind of looking at you and be like, what is happening? Can you explain that a little bit more in detail yeah. for our listeners? I don't think everybody yeah. knows what that is. Yeah. So a, a stoma is just an opening. And so I had to have my colon removed. So essentially my waist goes into a bag, went into a bag on my side. Hmm. Um, you can have a urostomy if you lose your bladder. Uh, you would 
essentially have a conduit that would go into a bag. And so uh, colon cancer uh, patients often need to have a colostomy. Same deal, waste ends up in a bag. People with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis oftentimes have the need for an ostomy and same, same deal. And, you know, I'm sure a listener is thinking, oh, God, there's no way I could live. I just, there's no way. And that's all of our reactions. I'd rather die than wear a bag. And uh, I created a program after going through mine uh, to raise awareness. And I started to receive thousands of stories that blew up this restrictive lifestyle box that we thought we'd all have to live in, right? Can't travel, can't swim, can't work out, you know, can't be intimate, none of which is true. Can't have babies? No, absolutely not. I started to hear from police officers and firefighters that returned to the force with a bag. Uh, triathletes, athletes of all kinds, beauty queens, President Bush's brother, Marvin Bush. I got a call from the vice president back in 1984, went through ostomy surgery for ulcerative colitis, and he and I became good friends and strong advocates to encourage other patients. Um, I mean, there's, the stories are amazing, and, and, um, and yet we don't know that when we face it. It's like so many things in life. You know, there's no way I can do this. You get to the other side and go, oh, my gosh, not only can I do it, it's changed my life forever. And, and uh, so an ostomy bag is this uh, pouch that's connected to your small bowel that there's an opening in your abdomen, and it ends up in your bag, and you just uh, sit on the toilet and, you know, drain your bag into the toilet and, Close it back up and you, you keep going. So, you know, to play, I had to create uh, ways to protect what are called stomas, the opening. So I created a little hard clam shell uh, plastic cover, if you will, that I'd, you know, put an ace bandage around me and put it over my stomas and play. And half time, you just drain your bag and go back out. And it's, it's uh, less of a big deal than we think it is. But, um, I was very lucky that our owner gave me the chance at the time, Gene Klein, to work with the medical staff to get it uh, where I could protect myself and then gave me the chance with Coach Coriel to compete for my job. And, and uh, you know, there are a lot of places, a lot of coaches wouldn't have allowed that, but they did. And, and it's absurd, really, if you think about it. I mean, there are 100 players in line, 100 kickers in line wanting a job. And, yeah. These guys gave me a chance again. I mean, that's just ridiculous, right? Yeah. And uh, I'm just so grateful for that. Ralph, as we close here, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the advocacy work that you're doing, giving back. You have a foundation. Share with our listeners more about the work you're doing now away from the field and how they can get uh, involved and how they can help. Well, I started a company, uh, a patient engagement company. So we actually work with medical device and pharmaceutical companies and help them engage better with their patients. So that's my business that I do, and I speak a lot. Uh, but I created a program uh, called the Grateful Ostomate. So gratefulostomy.org, Grateful Ostomate is uh, one. And then we, we launched, a, we, we, we got a national calendar day called National Grateful Patients Day, which every year is celebrated uh, September 7th, which is the day that I returned to play football after my illness. So on Instagram, you can go to Grateful Patient, um, share stories of yours, or if you have one, or if you'd like to read other stories. And um, but Grateful Ostomy is what we're doing for uh, for patients with with ostomy surgery, and get to encourage them and tell their stories and and let people know that uh, there is absolutely a great hope uh, despite having to wear an ostomy. Mm. And your foundation website is rothbanershka dot com. That's where you can really where everything lives for the work that you're doing at Roth Banershka. Dot com. Let's close it with this, Rolf. In this season of life, so much that you've uh, been through and God has brought you to where you are. Tell us what the Lord is teaching you right now in this season of life. What are you kind of learning from God uh, in this present time? You know, I think as players, um, we get our, our backs padded a lot for things. I mean, even this this podcast, frankly, Jason, what, what I think the Lord's telling me is, you know, pat other people on the back. And he has been for a while. You know, it's humbling to even talk about this because it makes me reflect on, on the Lord's goodness. But we have an opportunity to pat other people on the back and encourage others. And, and for me, there's nothing more fulfilling than to do that, whether it's a patient I get to speak with who's right in the throes of it. And then I get to hear from him six months later when he's through this back to what he loves to do and to be able to 
encourage him is to me the ultimate. And it's true with our faith. We get to breathe into kids younger than us, families younger than us. I think God's asking me to, you know, um, reach down to the next generation and, and encourage them that no matter the hardship they're going through, there's a faithful God that will redeem them, get them through it. And one day they will get to look back at their life and instead of seeing the threads on the underside of the tapestry, we've heard the analogy, they get to see the, the beautiful tapestry on top and just kind of shake their heads with wonder, really, at uh, what they've been allowed to participate in. So I think that's where God's got me right now. He is Rolf Benershka, the former NFL kicker with the Chargers, drafted by the Raiders, then came into going to San Diego. 1983, Walter Payton, Man of the Year, Pro Bowl selection, All-Pro, and a member of the Chargers Hall of Fame. Rolf, it's been great to talk to you on the podcast. Thanks for sharing your testimony and your journey, and hopefully we'll uh, catch up again soon. Thanks, Jason. Love what you're doing. Keep it up. Many thanks to Rolf Benershka, the former NFL kicker with the Chargers from 1977 to 1986, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Great storytelling. Uh, A guy that's impacting lives, making a difference, and has overcome an incredible amount of adversity to now make the name of Jesus known through his testimony and through his faith. Really great stuff there. You can follow Roth on Twitter at Roth Benershka. Let me spell the last name B-E-N-I-R-S-C-H-K-E at Roth, R-O-L-F Benershka on Twitter. And then his website is RothBenershka.com. And I'm sure if you searched Roth Benershka, and even if you got the spelling wrong and you put in Chargers Kicker, it'll correct it for you. And you can check out all that Roth Benershka is doing we thank him for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. We also thank Compassion International for sponsoring this podcast. For $38 a month, you can release a child from poverty by providing them with food, education, medical care, and vocational training, all done in the name of Jesus, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. Over 1.5 million children being impacted by the great work being done from Compassion International. The website is Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Check it out. Release a child from poverty and sponsor them today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. You can always reach us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sports underscore Spectrum. You can email me, Jason, at Sports Spectrum. Dot com. We would love to hear your guest ideas, any thoughts you might have on this podcast or any ideas for future guests here at Sports Spectrum. Also, go to the Apple iTunes app on your phone that you listen to these podcasts on and leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. Know what you think about the podcast. It helps get the word out. Leaving a review on Apple iTunes on their podcast app. Go check that out as well. And of course, all of our content is found at sportspectrum.com, sportspectrum.com. Check it out, all the stories on the intersection of sports and faith. Thanks for joining us here on this episode. We will see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.